that, and uh, God moved upon the face of the water. Now, understanding the significance of water, water it could be the emotion, water could be a, um, the, the, the conscious, you know, the, the, the membrane between the, 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 the conscious and the subconscious. Now, why would God move upon the face of the water? Why would that be in the first part of Genesis and understanding creation? I mean, basically, the, the, these are talking about how creation came into existence. And I told you at the beginning, I needed to understand what the fundamental principle of matter was. So if God moved upon the face of the waters, what's going to happen? You're going to create a ripple, right? You're going to create some kind of interference pattern, OK? You're going to get waves upon waves that are going to create matter. That's how matter comes into existence, through motion, through emotion, all right, through the water, through God moving upon the face of the water. For those of you who don't know, we're getting a little esoteric. But the Sri Antra is supposedly the, the sound. It is the Om. It is the, and the Om is the sound that was brought in by the gods that is actually the sound of creation. It is what creates matter. It is what creates everything, is this sound of the Om. And what we're looking at here, this is a Tibetan monk chanting the Om into a tonograph, which is kind of along the same lines of the cymatics and some of the other things where you've seen, you know, uh, this particular one here, there's a plate, uh, a steel plate with there's sand spread on it. And the Tibetan monk, when he properly chants the, t the word Om or the tone of Om, it creates the Sri Yantra in the sand. So the sound that he's creating is actually creating a, a geometric pattern in the sand, which I thought was, was incredible that we'd be able to do that, it, it, knowing that the, the Sri Yantra is the symbol for the life or the breath of all creation. It is what brings creation into existence. Some of the interesting things that I've discovered uh, based on the 432. All right, the diameter of the moon is 2,160 miles. That's 432, you know, half of 432. The diameter of the sun is 864,000 miles, which is 432, or 432,000 times two. The precession of the equinoxes, which is 25,920 years, or 432 times 60. 12 hours equals 720 minutes, or 60 times 12, or 43,200 seconds. A healthy athletic adult at rest has an average heartbeat of 60 beats per minute, which gives us 60 times 60 minutes in an hour times 24 hours a day, which is 86,400 beats per day, which is 43,200 times two. The height and perimeter of the Great Pyramid has a ratio of 43,200 to the radius and circumference of the Earth. The original height of the Great Pyramid, if the capstone were replaced, was uh, 481,000.4 feet. Now, before I go further, I wanted to uh, clarify what the Egyptian inch and the English inch was, which are 0 .0001 from being different from one another. And they, they changed it. There's some um, confusing about when, when all that had taken place. So when I talk about the, the speed of light, miles per second, and so forth, the Egyptian inch and the mile, they were, they were very closely related, but they were just off just a little bit. So now, if we take the 481.4 times 43,200, you get 3938.685 miles, which is close to the actual polar, ra polar radius of the Earth, uh, which is measured to be 3949 miles. Whoops. That must have been my shopping list. I don't know how I got in there. If you multiply the perimeter of the Great Pyramid all the way around its base, which is 3,223 uh, feet, by 43,200, you end up with 24,734.94 feet, which is less than 1% margin of error of the measured circumference of the Earth. Okay, Stonehenge. Now, when they built Stonehenge, we didn't have Latin long. They didn't come along until later. But now that we know the grid system, we take 51 degrees times 10 minutes times 42, you know, all these things here, seconds north latitude, and you multiply them together, you get 21,600 which is a multiple of the 432. The speed of sound in granite is 12,960 feet per second, or 4320 times three. The harmonic sixth of the 432 is also 720 hertz, which we've got the, the 72 stupas. The Stradivarius violin was built to resonate at 432 hertz, which is, uh, some say, is one of the most precise musical instruments man has ever built. 
Now, this is something that I wanted to talk to you guys about because it was a, it's an offshoot of the healing. But let's say, for example, that I'm right, or this theory is right, that, that all matter comes into creation through harmonics. And how that works is, in a nutshell, you have the fabric of space-time. You have an interference. You have a, um, a harmonic interference that takes place that causes the vortex to spin, okay? Causes the torsion field to, to start to move. And it's all based on, on music. It's all based on musical ratios. Now, if all matter is, is based on that, then you could take sound, you could take the proper harmonic ratios and dampen or amplify the effect of matter. Now, this is a, um, a stone wall that was built by our ancients thousands of years ago at Pumapunku. And as you can see, they almost look like they were molded out of clay and, and built in there, right? But this is solid stone, and supposedly it was cut with copper instruments. Now, I don't believe that. There's no way. This is, this is hard stuff. I forget if it's granite or not, but there's no way these guys could have built that. But what if they knew the proper harmonic codes? What if they knew the proper frequency? What if they knew the musical harmony that we, it would take to make matter more etheric, to make it lighter, to undo the, the vortex just enough that it becomes lighter, it becomes easier to move, it becomes easier to, to cut, it becomes easier to form? Then this makes sense using just music. Because what did they have back then? They had musical instruments. That was basically it. You could use anything for a musical instrument, but they had flutes, they had string instruments. They had all kinds of things. And what if they knew the proper harmonic frequencies to build structures like this? Because um, some of the stuff I've seen, some of the research I've done, is nobody, stonemasons for 30, 50 years, they couldn't build that. It would be a hard time even moving some of these things. I think that stone on the right, that big one, there was like over 20 or 30 tons. So. If you understand how the fundamental principle of matter works and the harmonic damping, harmonic ratios, the harmonic frequencies, uh, the vortex action that takes place, then, then if on the proper frequencies, you could uh, essentially diminish the effect of matter. So my name is David Sarita, and uh, first of all, I'm just amazed at Jamie's you know, level of genius and you know, what he's doing with the toroid and the overunity effect that's happening with these things and the math, it's, it's incredible. And you know, I'm, I'm a person who believes in the field affecting matter, the body, you know, or you know, the field, the energy field, or, or invisible magnetic fields, or plasma fields, or even um, etheric fields interfacing with matter to produce overunity in electrical devices, but also in the body. Because we have an aura. I mean, Fritz Albert Pop, you know, the German scientist, proved that all living things are emitting biophotons in invisible, invisible spectra of light. So we are emitting light. And if you, if you have an injury in the body and you use a, an etheric device or, or a vibrational device that can actually affect your field, the body should follow. Einstein said the field is the sole governing agency of the particle matter. So the field tells matter what to do. Matter doesn't tell the field what to do. So Jamie's device, you know, when we, we first, we put it on my foot, and my foot, I had a, you know, two-inch splinter, very thick, went through my foot, and I had a lot of swelling for about three years, and I thought I was going to need foot surgery. And, um, it, you know, the, for the first time in about a year, it swelled up again really bad. And so we put the device, and you could feel the kind of humming and the vibration. We put it on my foot, and the next day, the swelling went way, way down. And, and I thought that was pretty amazing, because normally when I get these swelling attacks in my foot and they're really bad, it's red and purple, it can take over a week for the swelling to go down. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And then we tried putting it on my heart and I actually have a lot of emotional pain about how many injuries I've had. I mean, I'm an extreme skier, a skydiver, I was a tree planter for 22 years and I never hurt myself badly. But, you know, the drivers in Los Angeles, uh, forget about it, I, I got hit a number of times by you know usually women with no insurance and and got really messed up I was on crutches for six months from a slip disc um, so you know when you and then when I was just healing over one of these car accidents I was just getting ready to start exercising again and I was skiing in my socks across the hardwood floors on New Year's Day with my New Year's resolution and this two-inch splinter went through my foot so there's a lot of emotional pain 
around the fact that I was getting hurt so much um, in the house. So stay out of the house. The worst injuries I've ever had in my life are at home. So the key is to get out of the house. Um, but anyway, I felt that pain. The emotional part of the injury came up for me when I put this device on. And, you know, I'm a very sensitive person. I meditate a lot, but I'm not one of those wounded sensitive types that that always, you know, uh, kind of wicks my wounds over and over and over again. I'm the kind of guy who, because I'm a mountain person, and I just get up and go again. So for me to have an emotional feeling in relationship to a device is, is pretty profound. What this is, I call this the VESH 432, which is a vortex and electromagnetic sound healing. And what these are on the side here, these are uh, fused quartz crystal glass. So they're, they're pure quartz. They are man-made. They're not natural. Uh, it's kind of hard to find um, tubes or rods that would be natural like that. And the base that they're cut in is a acacia wood. And I've got two circuits running. Uh, one runs this way. One runs the other way, right? They're running um, uh, opposite of each other. And mounted in the middle is an inch and a quarter sphere magnet mounted on a spring, so it vibrates. And off to the side here, John, you got the, do you show that? That would probably be better. Huh? Okay. So you can see the, the angle of these here are actually at 19.5 degrees, so they go out a little bit. And here's my hookup for my, my stereo system where I, where I pump in the sounds, the frequencies. So this is just uh, one of the coils. This is uh, what I call the tabletop model because, um, yeah, see how the magnet just comes right off? It's mounted on a spring. And you can see here, now this is what I call nested vortices, how all these, these wires come together. They're not wrapped like this coil is, uh, they're, but they're actually wrapped in a geometric shape that created all these nested vortices. And it gives off a, an interesting, matter of fact, um, one of the first persons I showed this to when I built it, it wasn't even energized. It had no music going into it. I had no frequencies going into it whatsoever. I held it up to the person and she was like, whoa, that's really strong. What do you got in that thing? And well, of course, I'm in Sedona. Everybody does spiritual work, so they're all sensitive. But uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty interesting that somebody would feel something like that off of something that I built, and it's not even energized. Um, my most popular thing here, this is what I use mostly on people, is the black coil, which is essentially this coil here, which I, I overlap. Instead of everybody's going in the same direction, I actually do one circuit going one way, and then I overlap them. Uh, coming back, so I get the two circuits overlap each other and kind of uh, play on each other. So this black coil here, that's, that's just a uh, quick connect. Uh, so I have everything hooked up, I just connect it real quick. Um, mounted in the middle here is another sphere magnet, but it's, it's one inch instead of inch and a quarter like this one, but it's in a, a plastic uh, ball. I took a little plastic, uh, I think it was an inch and a quarter um, polypropylene ball, cut it in half, put the magnet in there, uh, polypropylene is easily heat welded, so I welded it back together using heat. Actually, I put it on a pan on the stove and melted it and put it together real quick. And then I drilled a hole in the top of it and inserted the ferrofluid. Now, I'm sure you guys all understand what ferrofluid is, which is essentially nano-sized iron particles covered in a suffocant and immersed in an oil or a, um, any kind of a, a fluid body that, that actually mimics the, um, uh, the magnetic field a lot better. Have you guys all seen the, what ferrofluid looks like? It creates this beautiful flower when you get when you get it in, 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 uh, when you get it magnetized. Uh, so that's what's in the center of this thing is ferrofluid, so it allows it to move and spin, and it centers itself. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being here.